based on what you guys just said, I want to I want to talk about something this morning that is fairly practical. It's not a lot of times, you know, we might come to Oasis and we have, have different people come speak all the time that are traveling through and kind of bring in maybe a fresh word or you know a, a deeper word. I'm going to give you something that I believe is a little more practical today. Um, just as ministers, many of us in the room are pastors and on staff of places. There's several that are lay people as well, um, running ministries. But I'm going to give you something I think will be practical. Um, Matthew 6, 22 says this, and uh, this isn't on their tie. It says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. If the eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. So just thinking about this, our eye, you know, our eye gives us what? Sight, which is vision, right? It's vision. And uh, unfortunately, when I turned 45, I had to start wearing these readers because my vision started to diminish. And I think sometimes as, as Christians, as leaders, we can, our vision can diminish and we don't realize it at times. And, um, you know, there's enough things that get thrown at us and people and struggle. It's easy. You know, wonder how does a church wind up where they're at? Sometimes it's because the, the, the vision got diminished, yeah. and all of a sudden they began to lose sight. And uh, for me, having vision is, is really important, and vision dictates where you're going. Vision lights a path for what's out in front of you, and vision is mightily important. So I want to talk to you today about vision, not really about how to get vision, how to receive vision, but when you get vision, what do you do with it? And a lot of us probably get vision from the Lord and we don't even know it and we just I mean I, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten vision and I've just like let it go right on by and had no idea and so I want to share with you a little bit about vision today and really just some testimony of how I feel like the Lord's done some things in my life Andy Stanley said this he said everyone ends up somewhere in life some people end up somewhere on purpose <laughs> those are the ones with vision the people that wind up somewhere on purpose is because they had vision. Vision often begins with the inability to accept things as they are, which develops into a clear picture of what could be. A clear picture. We, we don't want to accept things the way we are, and so you begin to have this picture of what could be. As opposed to just a dream, vision carries with it a sense of conviction that something could be done, not just the idea that it could be. Vision has like a conviction to it, like, Hey, this could actually happen. I'll share about that in a minute. A vision doesn't necessarily require immediate action. Often people feel like they must charge forward as soon as their vision is clear, but that can result in failure and disappointment. When we wait, the vision matures in us. It begins to mature in you, the vision. And we mature as we wait on God. And the last thing is that God is at work behind the scenes preparing the way for the vision. So think about that. When vision comes and we, we wait just a minute for vision, a couple things happen. The vision matures, we mature, and God's at work behind the scenes. And so sometimes that waiting time, it, it's important. And sometimes it can also be dangerous because a lot of times visions die in that waiting time. It can just die. It can be discouraging to dream about something that seems to have no chance of happening. And so I've had the privilege the privilege of having many visions die right in front of me. <laughs> I've had the privilege of that. I've got to change this because I can't preach off of a flat. <laughs> I can't, it's because I can't read. And, uh, um, but I've also had the opportunity to see God-given vision become a reality right in front of me. So I'll share a couple things. I've, I could probably share a lot. There was um, a few years ago we, um, when the book Heaven is for Real uh, with the Burpos had come out and they were telling their story about their son who had died, went to heaven, saw Jesus, saw this incredible thing, came back. He had this heavenly encounter on the surgery table. So Ron knows all about this because while that was happening, Todd came to your church to pray, right? Somewhere around there. And, and you and Mitch Strode have prayed with Todd and through that whole process. And so I'd heard this story and, and then I, the book comes out and across the nation, this book really blew up. I mean, it, and yeah, for a book to blow up, it's a God-given thing. Here in Kearney, at our bookstore, they sold, um, they sold two, I can't remember what it was, two or three times the number of every other bookstore in the nation. They were selling way more. We sold over 300 of those books out of our church, which was just, I mean, we just kept ordering them, we kept selling them. 
And um, we, we had this idea of what if we brought them to town to share their story? What if we brought um, Todd and his son to town to share their story? And uh, what could we do with that? And we, I, I had been to a conference at Gateway a year before that in, with Robert Morris down in South Lake, Texas. And I'd heard this new comedian named Michael Jr., and uh, I don't know if you've heard of Michael Jr. before, but he's, he's, a, he, he's, a, he's a pretty good comedian. And so he was just kind of, just to been kind of getting things going. And, and we, you know, we thought, well, what if we, what if we asked Michael Jr. to come and the Burpos, and we called this thing a night of hope and laughter. It had this vision. It wasn't just a dream. It was a vision. It was something that was in me that I knew like, hey, this is what we should do. And so what do you do? You take a step of faith, you make a phone call, you invite some people to come. They say yes, and, and we wind up saying, where are we going to do this at? Let's do it at the fairgrounds. So we did it at the fairgrounds, and, and um, we sold $5 tickets. Kids were free, college kids were free, and uh, we had tickets dispersed everywhere. We had no idea how many people were coming. But at the fairgrounds, as we were setting up chairs, we kept thinking, it's not enough. It's not enough because you could set it up from like a thousand all the way up to whatever. So we wind up setting up five thousand chairs, and we'd only had three thousand tickets sold um, that that we kind of thought of. <laughs> you had to, and uh, so we we wind up bringing them into town. And the the guy at the fairgrounds he kept thinking like, "You're crazy." He kept looking at me like, "Really? You want us to set more chairs up? You want us to do more? You want more?" And we're like, "Just do it." <laughs> and so, but there was a piece of faith that was attached to it. And uh, anyway. Long story short, Michael Jr. comes in, and, um, well, one of the crazy things was traffic was backed up down all the way Avenue in about 14 blocks, and uh, all the way to Highway 30, and the person driving Michael Jr. in was stuck in that traffic, and so they jumped up yards, driving, driving through yards to get to the fairgrounds to, to get Michael Jr. there, and we're sitting in the green room before the service, and we're praying, and we get done, and Michael Jr. says, and I had told him about the burpos, and he didn't quite understand this whole thing. He was like, yeah, 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 whatever, book, yeah, yeah. And, but we're praying, and, and we get down, and Michael Jr. says, I think I'm supposed to do the altar call. And this is a comedian. Comedians usually do things on the front end. They do laughter. They, they really don't, a lot of them don't give altar calls, right? He goes, I think I'm supposed to give the altar call. This is something that, that he really hadn't been doing at that point in time in his life. And um, <clears throat> I said, great. So Michael gets up, does his comedy, was great. The burpos get up and start sharing their story. And he's sitting next to me. And he's realizing, this kid saw Jesus. He looked at me and said, I got to follow the kid that saw Jesus? <laughs> I said, you asked. <laughs> and so, you know, so he winds up going up and giving, this, giving, giving an altar call. And 300 and some people came down front. And a couple of the most uh, uh, incredible things to me was this 80-some-year-old guy in overalls with a cane walking down the center aisle. And another one was a big, strong, muscular guy walked right in front of me, had his two kids in his hands and the third one behind him and tears were running down his face as he came with his kids and gave his life to the Lord. It was a powerful moment. And I could share a lot of things about our relationship with Michael Jr. and some other things from that. But that was a time when stepping out in faith to do something, like we were living, um, like many of us might, in our, our church for a long time lived week to week financially. Like, hey, if, if there's not enough that comes in this week, we may not get paid next week. I mean, pretty close to that, right, Connie? She knows. It was pretty close, running, running along. And so to take a, a step of faith um, 15 years ago or 13 years ago to do an event that was going to cost $16,000, which is not a lot of money, but it was a lot of money um, we, that we didn't have for, uh, was like, what's going to happen here? And we had no idea. All we know, it was a huge success. And... Um, the next day, Katie tallies up all the, all the money that came in, and there was $16,025 that came in. That all happened not because it was a good idea, but because it was vision. Vision is prophetic revelation. Let me share one more piece of vision just because it ties into where I'm going. So a lot of you know about what we're doing on our property here with the Jeremiah 29 initiative. And um, <clears throat> how did that all come to being? Well, I saw it in my mind's eye. I saw what the land looked like. God then confirmed it with me. He brought somebody here that said, 
that came and told me this crazy thing, said, if you build it, they'll come. I hadn't shared it with anybody, and I know they were thinking about, if you build a bigger building, you'll have more people come. <laughs> but that wasn't what God did. God confirmed it. And then I began, then because once it was confirmed, I shared it. I shared it with our elders, and our elders confirmed it. And then we began it. We hired some landscape architects, and we began to like, okay, this is what I see in my mind. Where does this all lay out? And it was a little bit difficult because I saw what God showed me where things were to be. And then we kind of brought a group of people together to like, hey, let's talk about this a little more. Let's, let's, uh, let's invite some others to the table. But you know what they didn't have? The vision. And so they wanted to put things in all kinds of different places, which might have been okay, but I could not leave the conviction that God had in my heart. <clears throat> and that was probably hard on a few people because I said, I, I know that could work there, but this is where I really see where these pieces go. And... Um, the last thing the landscape architects drew up, because I talked to them about playgrounds, we talked about an amphitheater and a pavilion and, and uh, trees, and then they drew in these orchard trees. And uh, they said, hey, orchard trees would go really good here along with what you're doing with gardens. I thought that was kind of cool, and I got that. And about two weeks later, it was in January of 21, I went to Jeff Collins' camp, meet in Pal camp meeting in Palestine, Texas, and uh, it was a Thursday night. Joaquin Evans starts sharing, and he, starts, he says this. He said, you can have a basket of fruit or you can have an orchard of fruit. This was two days, at, two days after getting these, dr these drawings, three or four days, somewhere in there. You can have a basket of fruit, you can have an orchard of fruit. And then he goes in to start talking about trees and healing in their leaves. And then he goes back and starts talking about orchards. And how do you build an order, orchard? How do you take care of an orchard? How do you bring water to an orchard? And, how do you, how do you, and he preached for almost an hour on orchards. Have you ever heard a message on orchards? I've never heard a message on orchards. I was, I was so convicted of that moment, like in my spirit, like it was like God hit the go button. Like, I knew, I knew that I knew that I knew. Like, yes, do this. All of this is much larger than anything that I believe is possible. And a lot of times, a God-given vision is much larger than something you think is possible. And so, you know, we, we began putting this together. So we came back and we said, let's, let's uh, what I see in my mind's eye is what these trees look like in 10 years. If we wait 10 years to plant the trees, they won't look like that in 10 years. And so we ordered 120 trees and we planted trees on the property that that uh, most of them will have to be moved. And we started this process. And um, we have some playground equipment out there. We have some more that's on order that's coming. The city helped connect the hike bike trail to our property. And then last Monday, we did a ribbon cutting with the greenhouse and the gardens. And um, the vision is not finished. It's a 10-year vision. We're three years into it. And um, there's a long ways to go. And it still seems impossible to me. But how do we get to where we're at? How do you take vision and move forward? I, I didn't share that with you to get a pat on the back at all. I wanted to share it because I want to talk to you about how the Lord has led me through vision and carrying out vision. So I'm not talking about how to receive vision. I want to talk about how to carry out vision that God gives you. Um, about 20 years ago, I was listening to a message by Graham Cook. It was a 13 CD series called How to Bring Your Prophetic Vision the prophetic vision from the future into today. How many times do you get a word from the Lord or there's a prophetic vision and it seems so impossible that it's just out there? And a lot of times we think, well, one day God will accomplish that. It's just out there. And so we're just waiting on God, waiting on God, but most of the time, God wants us to partner with that vision. If we don't ever partner with it, it will be one of those things that never happens. It's kind of like we think God will... God's just going to grow the money tree out back. But that's not how it works. It works with us partnering with him where he brings those things that we need to us. And um, one of the things that Graham Cook talked about was how um, one of the key components about bringing vision into, uh, into fruition in your life was when you see, when God gives you vision, a lot of times you see that thing in the future, and what do you notice about it different? A lot of times you see yourself differently. One of the things you see in prophetic vision is that I'm different then than I am now. And that's the maturing process of you to get to that place. There's a character refinement to get to that place, to begin to step into places of faith and what you're going to walk into. Am I willing, here's a great statement, am I willing to trade my vision of me for God's vision of me. Because in order to step into vision, that really is the first thing that has to happen. You have to trade in your vision of you 
for God's vision of you. Listen, my vision of you was never, of me, was never a person standing in front of somebody preaching or talking even. I, when I was young, when I, up till I was in my mid-20s, I wouldn't be caught dead in front of people with a microphone. I did not talk. I was shy. I was reserved. I was quiet. God began to show me things, and he began to put me in places where I could partner with him to begin to change to his vision of me to step into what he wanted me to do. If he would have called me when I was 18 and told me I was going to be a pastor, I would have ran for the hills. He actually didn't call me to be a pastor until I'd been pastoring for 11 years, or at least when I felt like I was called. <laughs> and so he knew, finally, Mitch will finally accept it. Okay, here's a verse. Proverbs 29, verse 18. You guys all know this verse. Where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. But blessed is he who keeps the law. Where there is no prophetic vision, people cast off restraint. Think about the difference between dreams and vision for a minute. There's a big difference. Dreams are, we all dream about things that could maybe happen one day. Then there's vision that comes. I would believe that Henry Ford had not just a dream, but he had vision. I would believe that Thomas Edison didn't just have a dream, he had vision. There's a lot of things I have dreams of. I have some dreams. God gave me dreams. Well, I could say they're God-given dreams or they're Mitch dreams. I don't know. It's not a vision, though. One of them is that I have a, I have a dream for a Christian high school in Kearney. And I could, tell you, I could tell you what it looks like. I could tell you where I would put it in our city right now, where I would build it. I would tell you what kind of classes they would offer and, and how it would be completely different than any high school in the entire, that, that anything is going on high, with high schools today. I, I, would, I could tell you what the atmosphere is, what the sounds are, what the smells and the colors are. That might sound like vision, but it's really dreams. And the reason why it's a dream, because there's nothing, there's, there's, there's a dream, I think about it, it makes me happy, it's something that I could do, but there's never been a, a deposit from the Lord that, that reveals vision with a how. There's, there's no vision, it's a dream, it's really a dream. I also have a dream of running a food truck. I could tell you what I would do with a food truck. I, would t I could tell you when I would do it. I would tell you what the different kinds of smoked meats that I would be serving out of that food truck. I, I, have, I have a dream of running a food truck. But I don't have vision for a food truck yet. God might give me vision for that dream someday. Because sometimes God will take a dream and put vision to it. But I don't have vision for it yet. Do you see the difference between a dream and a vision? Because sometimes we, we take dreams and we put them in the vision category and we get frustrated. I'm not frustrated. I'm not part of helping a high school start right now. I mean, Andy's like, good Lord, Mitch, what else could you do? And uh, uh, I'm, not, I, I'm not frustrated with that. But I get frustrated when I have vision that doesn't move forward. There, there's a difference between the two. A vision is a deposit that God puts within you. Prophetic vision actually has revelation. W without it, people cast off restraint. Without it, they do whatever. Th whatever. The, actually, the Word of God gives us vision for how we should live our lives, right? There, there's, 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 there, it's not the law. It's vision for how you should live out of love to the Lord. It, it's vision of how you should live. And without it, we cast off restraint. And, and we just do whatever we want to do. It's vision that keeps people, and starting with yourself, moving forward. Vision doesn't have to be something grand. It could be, vision could be um, something really small about you see yourself going to Starbucks today, and I don't know why, because I don't go to Starbucks and I don't drink coffee. But I see myself going to Starbucks today. Following through with that vision would be me showing up at Starbucks today and asking the Lord, why do you want me to be here today? That would be following vision. Vision sometimes could be really small. It could be minute. I, I remember one time I had vision. I, I stopped to see a guy. Um, it was actually my uncle working at a car dealership. And I didn't even know why I was there that day. I stopped. We wound up in this little hallway. And all of a sudden, God gave me this, this like scripture and prophetic utterance for him that I had no idea was going to come. I didn't know that. But I had to actually go there to the car dealership or the rest of it wasn't going to come, right? But I had vision. I saw myself going there. And I'm like, why would I go there? What am I going there for today? So um, having, having vision. Vision causes you to listen. Vision causes you to restrain your options, and there's so many options in life, we need to restrain our options. So I had options on Saturday, something I care a lot about, which is Awaken the Dawn and this 24-hour prayer thing that we've done for several years, Up a Spirit of Life, and, and I was part of just like helping, 
get some things going for that. And all week long, the Lord kept talking to me about, I got somewhere else for you to go. And I'm like arguing with him. What do you mean you got somewhere else for me to go? Like that, that's our worship team's playing from four to six. I need to be there. But God kept calling me somewhere else. And he gave me vision of, I shared it earlier, of, of a college roommate that I had that God's been reconnecting me with. And I felt like I was supposed to go to his tailgate and hang out with him, which paid off. He made New York strip steaks. I was expecting a bratwurst. But no, but it paid off because me and his son, we, we just, we were able to just to connect, have another deeper conversation. And I believe that's leading somewhere. It was a seed that was planted. And then as a bonus that I didn't know was going to happen, I got to see my brother who lives in Kansas City, who lost his job three months ago, hasn't got a job yet, and um, he's got a son who uh, is a great athlete who got a concussion last year and has been struggling with heavy depression ever since and anxiety, can't go to school, can't do anything. And um, I was able to stand with him at the 50-yard line, hug him, pray with him, not just on the phone, right there with him. And I was like, man, God, you are so good. My heart was like, I couldn't figure it out because I, I wanted to be where, I wanted to be at, I know I don't have to apologize, but I wanted to be there. <clears throat> yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. No, oh, praise God. Well, we were, I was praying right there in the middle of the... Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> Praying. So what vision does, vision causes you to restrain your options. It causes you to restrain your options. It, it, it brings it in. It's vision that gives pain a purpose. <laughs> like working to lose weight. <laughs> or, you know, um, you know, working to finish school, or whatever it might be. It's vision that gives pain a purpose to work through something to get there. I watched this incredible movie this last week. Um, I don't even know what it is. It must have been on Prime. Um, what's it called? The Astronaut Farmer? No. Um, it's the first, first um, Latino uh, person to go on the space shuttle. In 2003. Do you say Ole or Jose? Ole. Jose is his name. That's why I asked you. Uh, million, million mile farmer, astronaut, million mile. In his, his family came to America as migrant farmers. And his dad said, this is all you're ever going to do. But he had had a dream from a child of being an astronaut. And he got denied like for 18 straight years. Like 18 years in a row denied from NASA. But he kept... He, he learned how to fly a plane. He learned how to scuba dive. He learned all these things he did. It's an incredible story. Incredible. Um, pain with a purpose. Sacrifice. So here's the verse. We all know this. Habakkuk 2.2 2 says what? Write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. That he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it carries, wait for it because it will surely come. It will not tarry. The, write the vision and make it plain. The greater the sacrifice, the clearer the purpose has to be. That's why you've you got to keep it in front of you. You've got to write it. You've got to draw it. You've got to see it in front of you. Listen, I spend a lot of extra time up here at church doing things because I have vision for it. Vision motivates you to go do something about it. And sometimes others grab a hold of that vision and they'll be here too. So, but what somebody, what you want to do when you have vision and somebody else doesn't have it, you want to be frustrated that they don't have it. And the truth is you can't let yourself get frustrated they don't have it. You can ask God to give it to them. But you, you have to be able to share that vision. H how do you know if someone has caught the vision? Because you know when they can see it. Not just repeat it, but see it. When, when somebody sees it. Joe came to me when I first, the first Sunday that I um, shared the vision with our congregation about Jeremiah 20, the, the first time I launched it through our whole congregation, what we were doing, Joe came to me that next week and said, I need to talk to you because you saw it, you saw what I shared and you said, 
I was going to do something different, but God said, I need to spend the next 10 years serving the vision. And because you saw the vision. And so in that, there's pain, there's, there's pain with purpose, right? And there's, there's a lot of hard work. There's, but you saw it. And I remember standing, we, we, you wanted to share it with me, and we couldn't even get in the doors at El Patrero. We're standing in the, the vestibule, and you, you couldn't even, it just came fl- flooding out of you, and you're just weeping as you're sharing the vision God had put that you, that you grabbed the hold. You could see what I saw. And that's when you know. You don't just repeat it, you see it. What you see, you can reproduce. People envision crime, and they reproduce it. People envision lust, and they reproduce it. What you see, you can reproduce. I'm going to get somewhere in just a minute. But a couple other questions. Who is the vision from? You've got to ask yourself this. Who's the vision from? Because if the vision is from God, you can look at it and not be scared. But when the vision's from you, you'll look at it and be scared. <laughs> Now, God's vision could be, you might be a little scared, but when you know it's his, it's not yours. So you hold it like this. What's the vision for you, for your family? Two visions create dual vision that eventually creates division. What's the vision for you and for your family, if you're married and a spouse? What's the vision you have together? So I want to go some more practical with you, and I want to share some revelation about the process of vision that the Lord helped me with just this last week when I was having a conversation with Nancy, and um, I was kind of asked the Lord what I was supposed to be sharing today, and it just like, this is what I want you to share. And so I want to back up for just a minute before I, I just want to share a little bit of this a, a process. We talk a lot about mission and vision. For me, and people have their own definition for all these things, but for me, mission, mission connects why we are here. Why we're here, it describes purpose behind the vision. Mission is the heart. Vision is what we are actually doing. Vision is what we are building. Vision is foresight with insight from his sight. Vision is foresight with insight from his sight. So you have mission and vision. Mission is the why and vision is the what. And then, then I always throw in this values. Mission, vision, I always say mission, vision, values, because values to me, values are internal guides of how we operate to fulfill the vision. Values. And so your values matter. So like here at Grace, our mission is lives healed, family strengthened, communities changed. That's, that's like, that is the mission. It is the why. We are here to see lives healed, that they be saved, saved, um, healed, and set free. That families would be strengthened, that they would be discipled, equipped, and empowered. That communities would be changed as we serve, give, and love our community. Saved, healed, set free, discipled, equipped, empowered, giving, loving, serving, and all of that. That's, that's like the mission. Lives healed, families strengthened, communities changed. And then in the vision, there's, there's different things about vision. Vision is what we are building. And we have vision for church and how we function church and services. And we also have this other vision God gave us, this Jeremiah 29 thing. And, um, you know, it started with a word. That vision started with a word eight years ago. I think it was about eight years ago. It was standing out by the dumpsters in our gravel parking lot that we had at that point in time, which is amazing, in eight years. So standing there, and I heard this word from the Lord, I want to reconcile the land. And I was looking across the land and where Charlie was pastoring at Church of God at that point in time, and, and I knew that we had bought 10 acres of land from them, and they had five acres of land. And for me, in my, and this, it really wasn't from the Lord, but in my natural understanding, I thought, oh, reconcile, he wants to bring the land back together. How would that ever happen? That's crazy. Why would that ever happen? Want to, want to bring the land back together. And so I, I sat on that for a long time. That word reconcile the land, that's just like bizarre. Like that doesn't even make any sense. And um, later, years later, when God began to share, show with me the vision, the imprint of this, and, and I wound up sharing it with Church of God, and they had some dormant land. They wound up giving us a little over two acres at that point in time, and, and all this, so expanded what, we, what, what God was showing me. But I looked at the word reconcile, and that word reconcile meant to bring to its intended purpose that there was an intended purpose for the land. And it was amazing when I went and shared with Church of God about a garden and a prayer center. Some of the people said, 
these have been in our prayers for years. But we don't know if we're going to be able to do it. But I see, so this is what God's purpose is for the land. So yes, we want to help you with that. That was somebody else having vision to see what God was doing to partner together. That doesn't happen, right? I mean, Charlie's with us today, so praise God. But to bring to its intended purpose, that was, so God will take those things in the vision and begin to work it and massage it to get it to where it needs to be. Jeremiah 1 verse 5 says this, before I shaped you in the womb, I knew all about you. (laughs) This is the message. God says, I knew all about you. Before you saw the light of day, I had holy plans for you. Saying this to Jeremiah, a prophet to the nations, that's what I had in mind for you. I want to tell you this, God has something in mind for you. He has something in mind for you. What's in your heart? That's part of the mission and the vision. What's in your heart? There is a grand vision that God wants to place in each of your hearts, and I believe that God wants to unlock it. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and to harm you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. God has plans, plans to help you establish the kingdom of God in the world. How do we allow this plan that God has placed inside us to come forward? Mission, vision, values. Values are those eter- internal guides. The kingdom, there's, there's, there's kingdom non-negotiable things that God has placed in each of our heart. There are kingdom character traits that live within us that help to accomplish the vision placed within your heart. But for us, there's some values that matter. And the values are those internal guides that keep you towards the vision. Because God's not going to break those values to accomplish the vision. So here's our internal values. God is good all the time. It's an internal value to know that God is good. There's a lot of times where you want to believe that God isn't good, right? But he is good. And that's an internal value for me. Like when things aren't going right now, no, listen, God is good. That the second one is that I have a purpose. I just read about it a minute. I, I have a purpose. God has created me with purpose. When I believe that and I have purpose, then I know what I do matters. The third one is that nothing is impossible with God. Nothing's Because if I believe things are impossible with him, I will never step into the vision he has. But nothing is impossible with God. God's good all the time. I have a purpose. Nothing's impossible with God. And then this one that a lot of believers struggle with, I am responsible for me. Because <laughs> a lot of times we want God just to like, just change it, God, just change it. Like, we don't want to be responsible for us, but truthfully, I'm responsible for me and what God's placed in me. I am. I'm responsible for me. And the last one is this, greatness comes in serving. Greatness comes in serving. Those are values that guide what we do with the mission and the vision. Mission, vision, values. I'm talking to you about how to see vision come into today, not years from now. How do you take that thing that God's placed in your heart, you're dreaming about this, become vision, how do you pull it forward? Part of it is living according to your values, And for me, it's God's good all the time. I have a purpose. Nothing's impossible with God. I'm responsible for me. And greatness comes in serving. These values guide us to help us walk out vision. I don't know what your values are. But your values will determine what you do with the vision that's placed in your heart. The prophetic revelation. Now listen, as a lead pastor, it's my responsibility to get vision. The prophetic vision. As a lead pastor, it's my responsibility that doesn't mean that I, I'm the only one that gets vision. As a matter of fact, Tracy might have some vision. He might come and share something with me that confirms what God's already speaking in my heart or might activate something in my heart. But it's still my responsibility to get vision. But if you are a pastor here on staff or a, or a, a minister where you're serving under someone else, God wants you to walk in submission to the vision of whoever you're serving. Absolutely. He wants you to walk in submission to that. Um, he might give you something that's for a later time. I remember this, this great, great story. But he wants you to, 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 in the area of ministry that you lead, he wants to give you vision. There's this great story I always remember that talks about submission because it's so important. And uh, John Bevere talks about it in Undercover. He talks about it as a youth pastor. He, he had had a large youth group, and he wanted to start small groups with his youth group. And he had went to uh, Larry Stocksteel's church at Bethany World Prayer Center, and he had done all the research on how to do small groups. And they'd been planning on it for six months, and they had developed group leaders, and they were ready to do this whole thing and launch into small groups. That was the vision that he felt like he was supposed to be doing. And um, 
as he got ready to do it, he was sitting in a staff meeting with this bigger church and all of the leaders and the senior pastor said, listen, I've heard from the Lord in this season, for this next season, we're not going to do groups. And he said, well, w- wait a minute, pastor, you mean everybody but the youth group, we're still going to do groups. And he said, no, the Lord said right now, none of us are going to do groups, which I don't know why. And he talked about how mad he was, <laughs> how frustrated he was. He left church that day and went home and he was so frustrated. And his wife helped him and said, listen, if this is the man we're serving, we need to stay under his vision. And so that's important. But John had had everything he needed for groups. God still had vision for that for him in his life. And so being able to do that, but I want to tell you this, even at whatever area of ministry you're leading, God wants to give you vision. He wants to give you vision. And as you submit that vision to your leadership, They'll confirm it. Don't be afraid of getting vision. And don't be afraid of even like, I'm a, I'm a, I, sometimes I can be a, I'm a yes man in a lot of ways, but I can be a quick no man <laughs> until I take time to process it and think about it. And then I let the Lord actually speak to me about it so I can go back and say, you know what? I think you were right. <laughs> so don't, don't be frustrated when that happens. But um, if, if your leader is kind of like that as well, um, But your area of ministry, how you take care of things, how you run things, how you lead your team, how you communicate, God wants to give you vision for that. He wants to give you vision. If you'll take vision, actually, and communicate vision to your leadership, most of the time, they're going to confirm that. Most of the time, you're not going to have a John Bevere situation, but that was was something from the Lord. But most of you, I just want to tell you, all of you that are not lead pastors, God has vision Don't rob yourself of not walking out the vision, the prophetic revelation he wants to give you. And even if it, what you walked out and stepped out the first time and it didn't, it seemed like a failure, doesn't mean it wasn't God's vision for that. He had something for you in that to learn to grow into. Like, man, Dalton, you had had vision for a camp last summer, right? And in a lot of ways, there were some things that were great that went great. In some other ways, there were some things that were disappointments. And I want to tell you that you had vision. Whether, whether it was all walked out right or not doesn't really matter. God knows that you walked it out. And that's all that he cares about. And then you get to learn from that. But sometimes we could be disappointed. And then the next time we get vision, we just like push it to a side. And I want to tell you, don't push it to a side. Like, like you had people behind you walking that out, even though it didn't all come together Habakkuk 2, write the vision, make it plain on tablets that he who reads it may run. I had a vision at, um, in Oklahoma City at a Greater Things Conference. I was sitting there minding my own business and, and, um, and well, I mean, I, I was receiving something that was being released from Martin Smith who was leading worship about a season of joy. And um, I just immediately wrote this down, find the joy, run in the joy, give the joy, keep the joy. Never lose the wonder. Live and keep living. And, and I wrote down right here, September 10th. Like, there was vision for a series that I'm doing right now on joy that I just immediately wrote down. And God, he gave me these things with it. Find the joy, true identity, run in the joy, strength of your identity, give the joy, impact, speak life, keep the joy, never lose the wonder. You want to know how many times God's given me that kind of vision? that I didn't write down, and I lost it, it is more than I can count. I've lost more vision than I've walked out. But I've learned to write down the vision. I have a, I have a prophetic thing about me that the Lord showed me. It's probably in a drawer somewhere for years. That was, it was about my identity, that things that God said, you're going to walk in these things. And, and I wrote it down like this, this was... This was him shaping my character and who I was. Thanks, Cheryl. Good to see you. And so I was writing those things down that were there. Once you know it's vision, it's more than a dream. Write it down. Proverbs 15, 22. So what do you do after that? I got just a couple steps here. Proverbs 15, 22. Without counsel, plans go awry. But in the multitude of counselors, they are established. Without counsel, plans go awry, 
but in the multitude of counselors that are established. The mission's the why, the vision's the what. Plans are how we're going to accomplish the vision. The plans are the how. Many times we stop at vision and we don't know what to do with it. God will begin to give you the plans. The plans for it, the how. Plans are how you're going to accomplish the vision. Plans take time. We, with Jeremiah 29, we, we took a year making plans with the landscape architects of how we felt like things were going to lay out because I needed somebody to help us with those plans, and we wrestled with those plans. Plans are talked through in counsel. Plans are worked over and over. The mission and vision are from God, and the plans are really our part of partnering with God. If vision is the revelation, then plans are belief in the vision. Like sometimes I wonder if I actually believe in the vision that God's given me. If I don't ever believe in it, that means I've never made a plan with it. Now I tell you to take to actually take a vision into the day, you take that vision and you wrestle with it enough to ask God to give you plans. Now I've had things that I thought were vision, I asked for plans and I could not get plans. Guess what? That vision didn't go anywhere. And then years later God brought it back to me and gave me plans for it. And other ones are still sitting on a shelf. And I don't know what to do with that. Because I don't have plans. But if you don't have plans, you can't see vision move forward. Plans help you have belief in the vision, belief in the revelation. I began answering the question and asking the Holy Spirit, how are we going to accomplish what God has placed in our heart? And listen, it takes the right counselors who believe in God and believe in you to help you come up with the right plans, which involve timing. They involve timing. You, the counselors in my life my board of overseers confirm vision and help me with timing. And I believe in God and them enough to know that they're going to help confirm timing for me that I need. I believe that God will work through us as a group. Sometimes we hold on to things like this and it doesn't ever come to pass because we make it about us and not about God. This is your vision. I'm going to trust you with your vision. Mission is the why. Vision is the what. Plans are how. We're going to do it. And then we have, what do you do once you have a set of plans? Well, then you have to have goals. Goals. Listen, believers run from goals like no other. I've never seen, I've never seen a group of people so afraid of goals. Believers are the most afraid of goals people on the earth. Because if they set a goal and it doesn't come to pass, they think they didn't hear God. And I want to tell you, that is a crock. We're not going to get it all right. We hear and see in part. But by never setting a goal, you'll never move forward. And many believers never set a goal about anything because they're just waiting on God to do it. And they have so little, listen, goals involve this, faith. Goals involve faith. Plans are believing. Goals are saying, I have faith now. When you have faith, you do what? You have a win. When we're going to do this, I'm going to set a date and what it's going to look like, an accomplishment, a result. By then, this is going to happen. Do all of my goals come to pass at that time? Ask Andy. No, they don't. But I set a lot of goals. I'd like this to accomplish by then. I'd like to see this done by then. God, now you got to partner with God. How are we going to do this, God? I got the plans and I got the goals. So many people are afraid. So many people would rather sit and dream about what could have happened and then complain about what didn't happen instead of stepping out in faith with God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, him, the rhema word of God. Faith is attached to the vision and becomes practical when I set a goal. Becomes practical. An expectation. And it's hard because unfulfilled expectations leave us disappointed, frustrated, and hurt at times. They do. I get it. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. I want to tell you, goals are the way to get to a longing fulfilled. I'm not telling you to go set your own goals. I'm telling you to ask God to help you set the right goals. This is another place he'll bring counselors into your life to help you set the right goals. You have the right people giving the right input. What if, what if I set a goal that I believe came from the counsel in the heart of God? I'm not talking about fleshly random goals. I'm talking about how easy it would be to accomplish the plans of God. I'm not talking about how easy it would be to accomplish the plans of God if I won the lottery. I'm not talking about how easy it would be because that's never what it is. I'm talking about God-given goals. And if I set what I believe to be God-given goals and work with them open-handed, then I realize it's God's vision. So God gave me vision several years ago. I was driving down 11th Street, and I looked to the right, and there was this big strip mall that had been a, um, it had been a, um, they had done telemarketing 
for a bank for years and it had been closed for a couple years. This whole strip mall was one big um, phone center. And I heard the Lord say, here. And I was like, here what? And then this vision came. I saw all the way across the strip mall, I saw these, I saw these different things. I saw, um, uh, I, I saw a food pantry. I saw a place where there was um, uh, people coming and getting better in their health. I saw a place where there were life skills being taught, and I saw a church on the end of it. I just saw it. Just right, all of a sudden, I saw these like labels over this strip mall. You know how it would have different stores. Boom, 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 boom. Well, that's crazy. That's crazy. Sat on that for a long time. Went to Cyprus. Was in the island of Cyprus with Jeff Collins. Last day we're there. They're praying over us before we're ready to leave. Matthew Rudolph starts praying over me, and he prophesies. He ain't been to Kearney. He says, hey, I see you. I saw this big light go from the north side of town. It went over, and it landed on the south side of town, and you were doing the same thing on the north side of town that was going on in the south side. Same thing on the south side of town that was going on in the north side of town. I'm like, whoa, I know where that's at. I knew where it was. Doing the same thing there that you're doing here. I came back here, and I'm like, I got no money. I got no anything. I went and started talking. Talked to somebody about who owns this building. The person that owned the building was not somebody that was going to work with me. Next thing I know, that building sells to somebody else that was a believer. Next thing I know, I'm walking through that building, and I got vision for the whole thing. I'm walking through that building, and next thing I know, they've already started setting up walls because they have other businesses coming in there. And I go and I share this vision with the guy that owns the business. And he goes, hey, I got this one space right here, kind of two-thirds of the way down, that you could use as a church, there's a pillar, and, and it just wasn't quite big enough. I wrestled with it. The elders, we talked about it. There was no peace. It was like, no, this isn't it. I knew where I saw the church. It was on the end, on the, on the west end, exactly where I saw it. I'm standing there, and I... I I'm like, what in the world? The guy calls me back three days later. He says, Mitch, I need you. To, the guy that owns this, I need you to come down here right now. You got time? Yep, over lunch. So I, come, I go down there, and I'm standing there. He goes, listen, he was going to put his offices in the West End. He had had this all drawn out. He had an architect draw it out, these beautiful glass windows, this whole, it was all redo. He says, I can't do this. He said, I, I went to this other building. I'm going to move my offices to this other building. This is where your church needs to be. I said, but, but this is your dream. This is where, he goes, no, this is where it's supposed to be. And so we went and we plant, we remodeled the whole place. We planted Grace on 11th there. Pastor Ron preached down there. And we started something and it was going great. There was nothing wrong with it. It was growing, it was growing great. We were learning some things as a church. All, just so many great things I can say about it. Two years into it. Two years into it. I mean, we're just getting started. We're doing fine. And Somebody, one of my elders is in my office, and he asked me this question. He said, I, this is really strange. He says, are we still supposed to be at Grace on 11th? I'm like, of course we're supposed to be at Grace on 11th. What do you mean? Get out of here. <laughs> Two weeks later, I had somebody else, wasn't an elder, had somebody else ask me, are we still supposed to be at Grace on 11th? Same statement, the same words. I'm like, oh, get out of here. <laughs> Started wrestling with that. Called her elders and their wives for a Christmas party. They were there, and I shared just kind of what I'm wrestling with, like, ah, I can't let go of this thing. What we're doing is great. I have no, we're not, it's not financially hurting us. It's not, there's no reason, but I'm wrestling with this. Had eight elders. Four of them said, I think maybe we're done. Four of them said, nope, we should keep going. Well, <laughs> Next week is Christmas. We have Christmas day, day after Christmas Day, driving to Omaha to my parents on the interstate. I'm talking to God. And I said, Lord, why would you have us take a business, turn it into a church, only to let it go? That's ridiculous. There's not even another church in town that wouldn't want it or need it. I don't know, I don't know anybody that would need it. We're not doing that. We're going to keep going. I told the Lord, end of story. <laughs> if you know how that went. The next day, the next day, the day after Christmas, I get an email from Tyler at the table. And he said, Mitch, I've been wanting to push send on this email for six weeks. He 
He said, how? He said, we're out of space where we're at. He said, how did you, I've looked at some spaces, I don't know how to do this. How did you turn a strip mall place into a church? That was the first thing he asked me. And then he said, he said, Are you, have you guys outgrown it already? <laughs> no, what's the answer to that? Have you guys outgrown it? And, 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 and then we just started talking. So then, then I, I, we started talking about things like, hey, we could share the space. We could do services different times. We, like, because I want to share whatever God, like, we, we started talking through it. And after about two weeks, it was like, you know what? This is not for us. Uh, this, this is, I think, I think we're just supposed to walk away and give it to Tyler. So we go and we meet with the landlord. I had taken my picture of that strip mall with all these different labelings, which there's several of those things were going on in there. There was a dance studio that was doing health and fitness by a Christian-owned person that's still there. There was a, uh, um, there was a um, healthcare place that was in there. There was there several things were going on, which was interesting to me. Compass is there, helping families um, with, with foster care. And this guy... Anyway, so me and Tyler, we go, we meet with this guy, and he pulls out this piece of paper I'd given him years ago with all those labels. And we hadn't even told him why we're there. And he slips that across the table, and he says, all I know is this is what's supposed to happen here. And, I, and Tyler reaches out, he grabs that, he pulls it over, he says, what is this? And I see the vision God had given me. I could see it go on him. Like I could feel it and see it. The vision I had went on him. And he's like overcome. Like, this is unbelievable. And we talked about it, and, and the owner says, all right, do whatever you guys want to do. If you want to pass it on to Tyler, pass it on to Tyler, whatever. I got my car. I said, God, you just gave him my vision. He said, whose vision? He said, your vision. He said, I have vision for this place. I have a purpose for this place. I said, all right, God. Even in the next two, it took us about two and a half months to transition out of there. Even in those two and a half months, I asked God several times, like, why are we doing this? And getting towards the end, like, I don't want to do this. We put blood, sweat, and tears, money, money in that we weren't going to get back. All, all those kind of things, right? God said, this is what he told me. If you went to Honduras and build a church for a pastor, could you give him the keys and walk away? I said, yeah. He said, why can't you do that in your own town? because it's not culturally acceptable. <laughs> Gave him the keys. They're thriving. Goals done have a sense of urgency and expectation. Vision is revelation. Plans have belief. Goals have faith. And the last thing is this. A goal has steps to accomplish the goal. Many set goals, but don't take steps one at a time to reach the goal. I got a goal. It's, it's, like, a, it's like a small vision. Like Jeremiah 29 here. We, have a, we had a goal for the greenhouse. We had a goal for the garden beds. We had goals. It didn't all happen on my timing, but we have goals for it. And there were steps to accomplish it. Vision is partnering with God. The steps are deciding to be a doer of the word. Vision is the word. It's word that comes to you. Vision is steps are being doers of the word. There must be something in your heart, a mission and a vision from God, a, a set of non-compromising values that, live, that you live by that will help you run alongside the vision. You take that vision of the Lord and you take a risk and you share it with trusted ones. Because if it's vision and it's not just a dream, you probably should be a little hesitant to share it. With counsel, you make plans. You put your belief in the vision. With plans, you activate your your faith, and you set goals. And you become a doer of the word and take steps toward the goal. One by one, step by step, you begin to see the God-given vision of the Lord become a reality in your life. Vision involves change. Vision takes risk. Vision is bigger. Vision sets direction. Vision inspires. Vision promotes. Vision builds vision empowers vision leads vision helps vision requires time and a timetable vision employs vision unites vision establishes the purposes and plans of god vision comes from the lord i want to pray today that first of all god would give you vision 
that the things that have been blocking vision in your life would be released because without vision, the people cast off restraint. Without prophetic vision, they cast off restraint. There is vision from the Lord that he has for you. And I, I want to pray that there would be a release of vision. I can't tell you how I get vision. I just know when it comes. I know when it's the Lord speaking. It's a deposit right here. I sense it in this innermost part of me that I know that I know that I know that was God. I'm not talking about a dream. Talking about a vision. Yeah, Kathy. <laughs> Makes me think of this hospital system in Florida somebody told me about. They went to the emergency room there and want to spend a couple days in this hospital and the entire big hospital system every hallway was filled with scripture and life and worship music was playing oh, and yeah. like the whole thing is like oh. this incredible big hospital system in florida anyway vision vision i just believe that you know to accomplish the kingdom things god has for us first of all we have to have vision yeah. and then what do we do when we get vision we have to believe in it enough like this is from god that i'm gonna set some plans I'm going to share it with somebody. I'm going to get some counsel. From that, once there's a go button, then I can set some goals. I can put a date in a result. Like, what do I want to see done by then to move it forward? And then with that, what steps need to happen to see that goal move forward? Mission, vision, values, plans, goals, steps. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, I... I just thank you for this group of men and women that are here today. They're faithful. They're true. They're sons and daughters of yours. They um, have such a desire to serve you and honor you, to love you, and to see your kingdom purposes come to pass on this earth. And Lord, you have put each of us in unique places. Just as it said, just as you told Jeremiah that you formed him in the womb, and that you knew him, and that you had plans for him from the beginning, I know that is true about each of our lives as well. And Lord, I know we miss a lot of things. I'm so thankful you don't hold any of that against us, but you pick us up and you say, come on, keep going. Holy Spirit, I ask you today that there would be fresh vision released to the men and women in this room. Fresh vision. Lord, that things that have been dreams in the past would be materialized into vision. Things that they've never thought about before would be dropped in their heart. Lord, that they would see a picture of what could be with you. They would begin to wrestle with that, share it with enough, enough other people that they could make plans out of it. Holy Spirit, we can't make any plans without you. We need you. Lord, help us to take the steps of establishing goals and putting steps behind that that are from you. Lord, we want to partner with you. you. You are giving us vision of things that you want to see accomplished in our lives. We want to partner with that. So Lord, I pray today that there would be an activation of vision. I pray for youth ministries, for children's ministries, for administration, for, um, uh, for, for Michael and CEF and, and Cheryl and, and vision for prayer around our, our state and our city and, and so many other things that are represented in this room. God, I pray that there would be vision, specific vision that would move us past dreams. And I ask, Lord, that there would be an activation of that. Lord, help us to risk a little and to step into those things you're speaking to us about. Lord, you know there are so many things in my heart that I have vision for that I can't do, but you can. And I want to partner with what you are doing. And so Holy Spirit, I ask you today, right now, for those things that you've showed me and you've helped me to walk through thus far in my life, I pray today, God, that you would impart that to those that are in the room, that they could have an expectation to see vision not be decades away, but rather pulled into the near future. In Jesus' name I pray. Lord, I pray right now, not just for ministry, but I pray for vision for families. I pray for vision of how things are done in their home. I pray for vision for parenting. I pray for uh, vision for finances. I pray for vision for relationships. I pray for vision for neighborhoods. God, I pray for vision. 
And I ask for a release of that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for enduring.